Okay. Hi guys, thank you so much for joining today's workshop. Um, we're really excited to have Jan, who is the head of design at Unveil Social and ADP List mentor for this workshop on the data triangle system. We'll hear about this per, um, system, which is like being, currently being used in multiple tech companies and larger organizations to look at design collections in a new way to allow us to make more informed decisions. Um, Jan, would you like to take it away from here? Sure. Um, I hope everyone is hearing me okay. Thank you for joining and I hope everything is, everyone is doing great and enjoying the event so far. Um, I guess I'll kick it off. So to kick it off, I will share my screen with everyone. If you just bear with me a second. All righty. Okay, let's hope that everyone can see my screen. And that started from thank you notes, which is hilarious. <laughs> All right, um, so data triangle system, what is that and what is it for? So essentially data triangle system is designed to uh, make better decisions avoid, to avoid favoritism, biases, um, uh, conflicts, and actually seeing a much bigger picture. Now I'm gonna start by all of your students or most of your students, you probably haven't had the chance to sit in the boardroom with different uh, stakeholders in, in, in the room and making decisions during a meeting. Something that you might actually experience when you graduate and start working as a designer in the field is something along those lines. On the, if people are not familiar with Mad Men, I highly recommend it's a cool show. Uh, and you'll see you as a designer being in room, typically. Uh, then you probably can have somebody from engineering, it can be either VP of engineering, director, manager, somebody or lead, somebody represents the engineering side. Then you will have senior VP of uh, customer success or customer support or something thereabouts. And then at the same time, you might have somebody uh, representing the uh, VP of sales. And uh, depending on the situation, you might also have a CEO or somebody higher up uh, who's making the executive decisions. Now, in a lot of cases, people, you know, when you do actually the uh, quarterly planning for the product roadmap, typically how it works is you get together, there's a bunch of features on the docket, like people have some ideas, uh, you have a product, you want to bring some uh, uh, new and cool innovative features to the product. And the conversation typically goes something along the lines of, you know, hey, you know, customer success, we must add feature X to the roadmap. Why? Because some customers are asking for it and the person is being pretty aggressive about it. Then the immediate reply or typical reply would be from somebody from engineering saying, hey, oh, hold on a second. We can't really do this feature X because we either don't have time or not enough people or resources and so forth. And then suddenly you have the VP of sales kind of tucking in and saying, whoa, 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 hold on guys. No, 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 we actually have to do uh, feature Y because if we don't, our customer, our uh, sales, sales team is not gonna be able to sell because some potentials actually looking for these features that our competitors have and we don't have, we need to do that. And then at that entire kind of conversation, you decide to kind of stick your five cents and saying, whoa, let's hold on a second. From the design perspective, we've done some research and we found that uh, we actually need to work on, on feature Z because our users are having troubles with whatever part of our product. So we need to address that. And this entire kind of dynamic of, of an argument uh, develops within the meeting, typically. After a certain period of time of back and forth and who's right, who's wrong, everyone is trying to pull the rock their direction, uh, which way we should go. At that time, somebody who's a senior in the room makes an executive decision and says, okay, that's enough. I've done with that. We're going to be going with the sales guy because we need to make sure that we're showing strong sales for the next quarter. That's the feature we're going to put down next on the roadmap and we start working on. Makes sense a little bit, maybe, but what does it actually do and what's the actual outcome and what just happened? So what just happened and what people would observe in this kind of situation is first, there's a conflict and it's always going to be there. Why? Because every department, especially when the company is a little bigger, tries to pull to their direction thinking that their need or their customer need or the client's need and so forth are a little bit more important than somebody else's. Now, all of that creates personal, this is essentially personal biases where each person thinks that my thing is a little bit more important than the others. 
And <clears throat> eventually it becomes, uh, it drives into favoritism, right? I'm going to favor this person or that client or that customer or that need or that problem. And so I'm going to concentrate it and I'm going to fight for it, regardless if it's important or not important, viable or not viable. And also a lot of it is being driven by fear. And typically fear is being utilized by sales uh, uh, techniques where they're trying to accomplish their agenda so they can actually close a deal uh, in some cases. And so they would say to the CEO or somebody higher up saying, if we don't have this feature on the docket, we're not closing this deal or that deal. We're going to be short in the quarter. So obviously, you know, somebody higher up in the executive gets scared, driven by fear that how am I going to explain to the stakeholders or the, you know, uh, the board or the investors why we fell short on that specific uh, quarter. And then the uh, final part of it is ignorance. Now, apart from the, all of that, you as a designer then faced with what I have to say, a data chaos. So in this situation, you are somebody who needs to make sense of whatever just happened in that boardroom, right? Uh, VP of sales want that. Uh, uh, SVP of customer success wants that. Uh, the CEO made a decision that we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, VP of engineering is unhappy because they don't want to work on that feature because it's too much, too much of an effort. And at the same time, you also have your own data. You also have your own information that you're coming from uh, research and studies that you really want to empathize with the users to solve their problems. Right? And in that situation, what happens is that now you have all this data living in all these different places. And when you hear it about this data, typically it's in a boardroom or in a meeting, it's not something that is being kind of given to you at every uh, uh, opportunity that the other department has. And so the end outcome of this kind of situation is that as a UX, right, you have all of your data from all the research you've done. Uh, with users uh, and so forth outside and inside stakeholders, engineers, and et cetera. Then you also have marketing department. Marketing department also goes and collects certain data points, right? How they acquire customers, how customers make decisions to buy a, a product. How do they find the company or the brand? How do they respond to offering and, and so forth, right? And at the same time, you also have the customer success side or, cust or, or customer support or sales team, right? Something that is related to the customer itself where they kind of have the data and information about what customers are complaining about, what customers are asking for, what customers are unhappy about, right? What are prospects that we're trying to sell to are unhappy about and, and, ext and extremely uh, uh, wanting to have in order to close a deal and so forth. And then going forward, you also have the business side, the business intelligence on so the business stakeholders, right? Each one of them has their own internal know-how of the offering and the marketing of the market positioning, how the competitors are being responded, responding to what the business is doing and a lot of internal kind of idea, uh, uh, idea generation and, and, and innovation and so forth. And also you have the engineer. Engineering has another perspective, another set of data that they also have from the QA side of, you know, something doesn't work well on the product uh, from their internal know-how of the technical side of, uh, certain things should work in a certain way or certain things cannot be accomplished due to whatever constraints they might have on the engineering side. Now, you have all of this going on in the company almost on a constant basis, right? You have these meetings where people are having these conflicts and trying to pull each other their own way of this feature, that feature, and all of these decisions are coming from some sort of like biases and fears um, um, and favoritism of I need to do my feature. And, and believe it or not, sometimes uh, when somebody comes in with a customer success uh, request and says, customer A and B ask for X feature. Did they actually ask for it? Probably. But if you have 25 customers and only two ask for the feature and that customer success person feels the, the, the pressure from those customers, they're gonna try and push the company to actually engineer and work on that specific feature. It doesn't mean there's gonna uh, be a, a viable solution for the rest of whatever 15, 16, 17 other customers, but those two are demanding it or even threatening to walk, right? Same goes for the sales. If there is 15, 20, 50 prospects on the docket that sales team actually working to, uh, uh, to procure, uh, walk through the, through, through the agreement and sign and onboard them as a customer, they might have two or three that will be demanding some very specific and unique features. 
Does that mean the entire company needs to jump and start developing these features? Odds are no. But in the moment of a situation of being in that meeting with this kind of a conflict going on, the VP of sales or somebody in a representative of the sales department will be pushing for those features. Why? Because the more clients they close in the quarter, the better they look, the better they can show numbers. And obviously if it's a startup, a uh, better chance to go in and raise some funding. If it's a big corporation, they make their shareholders happy, right? At the same time, you have all this data floating everywhere within your organization you're not really aware of that. Typically design departments are not aware of everything is going on in other departments. They are aware of what's going on within the design department, product, engineering, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of stakeholders. Sales teams typically are not something that you will be interacting with and they're not gonna be sharing with you all the data and know-how that they have from the sales cycles that they are observing out in the wild of customers complaining of whatever function in the application and so forth, right? So how do you solve this kind of a enormous problem of all this data being everywhere, conflicts right, uh, left, right, and center. Uh, people are not actually making decisions oftentimes with the right data and information in mind. Essentially, the solution to this problem is uh, what I like to call is the data triangle system. What is a data triangle system? Data triangle system is essentially based on three pillars. And that's where the triangle comes into. You have the outside, the inside, and the customer. Now, I'm going to decompose this a little bit, right? But before I do, I want to concentrate on, on what we're looking at right now. Outside, inside, and customers will be contributing constantly to a centralized data repository where typically a design department or research department will kind of go through, search, sift, analyze, tag, organize, and make it available to the entire organization at any given moment. Why is this important? Because typically when you need some sort of information or a data point, when you're working on a feature as a designer and trying to solve a problem, you literally have to know how to ask the right questions from the right department to get the right answer. Because if you don't, you're probably not gonna get the data that you're looking for. And eventually if you go and work and spend, let's say two weeks of a sprint working on whatever uh, solution you're, you're gonna be proposing, you're gonna walk into a meeting and then propose this, this solution and somebody on the sales team will say, you know, what? that's useless because I was just talking to a prospect or two and they said, we're not, that's not something they're gonna need. So in order for you to know that, you actually need to talk to the sales department somehow and have this information from them somehow. Unfortunately, oftentimes they don't actually share it unless it's a, an emergency and they need the feature so they can close the deal. So how this thing actually um, uh, deconstruct uh, a little bit to the parts. Now, what is outside? Outside essentially is everything you as a designer or design team will do. These are your uh, user interviews, your um, usability studies, ethnographic research, um, uh, uh, different analysis and so forth. Every data set that you'll be collecting from the users themselves outside of the company. Now, the next side is the inside. The inside is equally is important because that's where you collect all of your information or have those departments submit their information to you or the data repository system of every single thing from the inside. That's the internal know-how of the stakeholders or the founders, CEOs, and high-stake high executives and so forth, the engineers, uh, uh, the tech support, the business goals, and so forth. That's what you will, where you will collect all of this information, right? Now, customers is another pillar, and that pillar typically goes really untouched by, uh, by, the, by the UX department, if you will. You will have some information if you go out there and you talk to customers. Certain situations, especially if it's a smaller company or especially if it's a B2B company, you will not have that much of an access to actual customers to talk to them. So how do you get this information? Typically customer success, sales, uh, pre-sale, post-sale might share some information here and there. If they, if they heard something that kind of struck a, a chord with them and they will call and come to you and say, hey, you know what? I was talking to this uh, guy from this company and they, and they mentioned uh, so-and-so. What do you think about that, right? Otherwise, you will never hear about that unless you specifically go and ask. But then again, you need to know who to ask, what to ask, how to ask, 
so you get the proper answer. Now, all of this, all of this data that you're collecting from all these parts, right, have to live somewhere because if it's not being utilized, it's absolutely useless. And today, believe it or not, to my surprise, interviewing and talking to different uh, uh, colleagues in the field uh, and design leaders and so forth, a lot of this information lives in fairly, you know, solitude lifestyle. Google Docs, um, uh, Box, Dropbox, and so forth. No one really has the time to go and dig through millions of different documents on these virtual drive hard drives. And so it needs to live somewhere where it's accessible to everyone at any given moment when they're making a decision in that split second. Uh, and it needs to be tagged and organized correctly so people can find it easily. So how do we build this thing? There's a lot of ways of doing these things. And the way I like to kind of break it down is, is very simple. Essentially, uh, start with data repositories. When you start with data repositories, uh, there are several things to keep in mind. One, what is that tool going to be and where it's going to live? Two, will everyone in the company will have access to it? not only to consume it, but also to contribute to it. Three, will I be able as a designer or design team or somebody on the design team uh, organize and tag all of this information within that tool? Because then it will be uh, easier to uh, search for different information. And there's a lot of tools for that. Uh, my personal favorite is Dovetail app. They allow you to do a lot of different things. Uh, the tagging is probably their most uh, important feature. And you also have uh, Condense, I think that's how you pronounce them. Uh, you also have Tetra Insights. You also have uh, Aurelius, I think that's how you pronounce that. My apologies, English is my third language. Uh, user Bit. And then the second part to it is of course the, uh, uh, the data producers and consumers. Now, these tools essentially, they're equally half the data that you might be looking for, and they'll be equally the ones that will consume the data that you produce in Dovetail or any or one of these tools. And these tools that I'm talking about are Jira, Asana, uh, Monday, Aha, uh, Notion, Salesforce, Zendesk, and the list can go on and on and on because these are the tools for project and product management, and they might be equally consuming the data, or they might have the data that were input there from sales team or from the product team or engineering or stakeholders and so forth, where they go and they create these tickets for, I have this idea, or I have that idea, or I've heard this, I saw this, and so forth. Now, the second part, uh, the third part of this, uh, it's going to be the data sharers. Data sharers essentially are tools like Slack, uh, the G Suite, such as emails, uh, I don't know, Google Docs and so forth. That's how you share information with other people and so forth. And of course, uh, we can forget Microsoft Teams. Now, this is also important part to, to have where you can share with people this information. People can share with you this information through these time tools. Now, there's a lot of tools and typically these organizations uh, like, like our organization and other ones, we have a lot of different tools. Now, how do you streamline this kind of communication because you will be met with resistance when you're trying to implement something like data triangle system within your organization of, oh my God, there's another thing. I have to write something or I have to send something somewhere. I have to manage, I have to log in, log out and then so forth. In order for this to work, you literally have to make it as easy as possible for the rest of the organization to share the information with you. And essentially when I say you, I'm talking about the data repository system. Now, there are tools like Zapier that essentially has an ability to tie all of this together and create integrations within each other. So for instance, if somebody drops a message in Slack saying, I just spoke to this customer and this customer mentioned A, B, and C, they're having issues with, and this is what they have problems with, and this is the, uh, the pain point. And I think this is what they're looking for. That can uh, automatically be sent into Dovetail into proper uh, folder, if you will. And all you have to do is basically periodically check it and then tag it and organize those folders to make it available to everyone else. Now, I'll give you a bit of an example of the flow within our organization of how this entire process works and don't get scared, it's a little much. 
So this is the collaboration between design, product, and engineering. This is where it starts, goes through, uh, being bounced around, and so forth, and then exits at some point, right? It's not necessarily a waterfall type process. It's an agile process, but we do like to keep to know where things are at at any given moment. As you can see, we'll start typically in some sort of like a product or project management tool like AHA or JIRA, whatever the organization has. This is where we'll start with, here's a task. We need to, um, I don't know, add feature Y. Okay, from that point on, uh, we as a design team will take that task and we create the project in Dovetail. And we start the project in Dovetail. Okay, uh, does this, uh, task needs any kind of validation, discovery, invalidation, testing, research. Do we need to talk to users? Do we need to do any testing? Do we need to create wireframes and so forth? And we kind of then we start running it through that kind of a process of let's create uh, um, uh, wireframes. So let's create some questionnaires for users. So let's find, uh, make a list of people we do want to talk to, invite, and then have a conversation with and so forth. That's when we move this into progress. And at the same time, we start running it through our process of research and so forth. And then you see all the tools that we typically would use, like look back, usability help, user interviews, user testing, G Suite, Zoom, uh, you name it. And then again, once we have some sort of like an output of what we discovered during those testing, we immediately throw it back into Dovetail and we create very organized kind of type cards for each participant. We tag everything and we make sure that if anyone walks into this kind of a project, they can easily click on the tag let's say pain point and see all of the pain points that we discover uh, during that specific research with how many people, what did they say in the context of that conversation and, and so forth, right? And then it goes back to AHA or JIRA, another project, uh, again, project management for the engineering to see where we at, what was discovered, what uh, we have uh, um, allocated as pain points and our recommendation as a design team, what needs to be done and how it should be addressed. And then it goes to, again, uh, some prototyping and testing, uh, iterations, and, and so forth. So this is typically the process that we kind of go to. Not every single feature will go through this process. We will bounce around sometimes. So we'll skip certain steps based on the requirement of the project. But this is the kind of a, a holistic view of the entire process that we have. Now, the best part of Data Triangle system with all of these processes in place is essentially when you make decisions in that kind of a meeting that I showed at the beginning of this presentation, um, you essentially walk in with information in hand and that information is cross-referencing. So when you have, let's say, sales team came back uh, and put into Dovetail, again, I'm gonna be mentioning this tool, not necessarily you need to use that tool, but that's the one we use, um, came back and put in Dovetail that I spoke to, let's say, MasterCard. Uh, and MasterCard said that they need uh, this menu item uh, to be fourth on the list and not second. Why? This is why they explain. Okay. Then you as a designer or your design team goes out and does research with actual users that use the application that MasterCard uses as well. And you found that users were confused about that specific menu item being second on the list, but they weren't as confused when it was fourth. So you put that as a research point and the result into Dovetail, right? Now, when you go into a meeting to make decisions of the, the product roadmap and then salesperson or the VP of sales says, you know what we need to do, we need to implement this part in our uh, menu item on the mobile application because MasterCard wasn't happy about so and so. So in that case, for you as a designer, you can say, you know what, he's right. Because we also found that part being a problem on the user side. So you just cross-reference two points that had similar issue. And when you do that, that means that now you really have to work on that feature. Now there is no saying something is more or less important. This is important. Why? Because users are confused by it. Uh, the customer is uh, annoyed by it. That's already two uh, uh, data sets that give you the, the chance to fix the problem. When you have even three of them, even better. But that's essentially how we make decisions in the company to what exactly we're gonna be working on the next quarter, half a year to a year to make sure that we actually solving problems and we solving the three main aspects 
of making a product and the company successful. It's uh, customer satisfaction, usability, and business uh, uh, quality and business requirements uh, to be met. That's essentially in a natural data triangle system that helps people make decisions better. Thank you. Now I think we can open up for questions. Yeah, if you guys want to ask any questions, you can um, put it in the chat or. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, are you asking regarding the data repository system or tools in terms of the usability side of using for research? Both. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I mentioned, Dovetail, I absolutely love Dovetail. Uh, several reasons. It's extremely simple and easy. When you, when you share it with other people, it's really easy for them to understand, even if, if they're not a designer necessarily. Uh, they have a really I think they're one of the few, if not the only product right now that allows a complete uh, uh, transcribing feature, which means if I do, uh, if I interview people over the Zoom, right, and I record this conversation, I can literally just drop the video into the tool, uh, click the button transcribe, two, three minutes later, I have the entire conversation as a text that I can go and tag uh, however I need to. So that's very, very, very useful and saves us a lot of time uh, on my team. Uh, in terms of the research side, I do like user interviews instead of, for instance, uh, user testing. Uh, why user interviews a lot more? Well, it's more affordable. Let's start with that. Uh, and I like to work in startups, and so startups typically have their own smaller budgets rather than huge budgets of uh, companies like Google that typically have endless budgets for research. <laughs> um, so user interviews is a great tool to kind of uh, recruit people for your studies. Um, then look back, look back allows you to, uh, record every single thing happening on, on the screen when people interact with your product, uh, and also at the same time can record the voice and the face of the person using, uh, either a webcam on the computer or a front facing camera on a device. So you can have kind of a view of not only how people, you know, touched your product and uh, tapped and, and, uh, clicked on. But you also see immediately if uh, on their face an emotional response to it, which I think is, is equally important. And uh, unfortunately, from all the boot camps that I've at least seen, no one actually mentions anything of that sort. Everyone is, here is the tool, just observe how they use it, uh, record their tapping on the screen, and see where they stumble, right? Now, where they stumble, here's a funny thing. You might see that they stumble somewhere, but at the same time, they might, you might see a delight in their face. So are they stumbling because they're stumbling or are they kind of stopping for a second because they enjoy what they're looking at? And that's a very important aspect to know when you're researching a product. So look back is definitely one of those tools that I like. I see more questions. Uh, do you have any tips for explaining your designs to teams who might not necessarily know design language concepts? That's a great question. Um, try to find, I found very useful over the years. And, and again, uh, I don't know how much people told uh, the participants of who I am. I've been in this industry for almost 25 years. And over the years, what I found is uh, giving a real world reference to what we're trying to say. Uh, and I can give you a great example of that. My last role, I was head of design at a cybersecurity uh, enterprise B2B type company. And I was having a debate with, uh, at the time, my head of product, the company. Uh, and so we had several types of products. One of the products were the back-end uh, management system for our technology when it's being deployed at the enterprise. And as probably everyone here knows or will know at some point as designers and you walk into the industry, you will find it pretty interesting that 
a lot of the administrative tools, such as designed for uh, infrastructure, system administrators, IT, tech support, and so forth, they're really um, not usable <laughs> uh, at all. Uh, and a great example of that is, um, I don't know if everyone here heard that story, I think it was last month, that Citibank lost half a billion dollars on one single mistake in the UI and the UX that they made on their uh, wiring, uh, tr wire transfer system, internal system for their employees. And so one of the employees did not understand actually the system and thought that they're transferring just the interest rate on, on the loan from one of the cosmetics uh, giants, which was I think seven or $8 million. And by mistake, wired the entire debt uh, covering, which was slightly over half a billion dollars. <laughs> Um, so that's, you know, um, simple as that. And um, Citibank went to court to try and retrieve the money back, saying it was a mistake. And the court ruled against Citibank, saying, well, if you didn't design your software properly, well, it's your mistake, not somebody else's. So having said that, when I was having this debate with uh, uh, my head of product at the time, uh, we were having a debate about humanizing the, the communication in the product because I'm a big advocate of, of uh, making software in such a way that it talks to the people just like I talk to you as human to human and not machine to human. Now, one of the problems is uh, it became almost like a standard that the communication is very machine-like, right? When you go and you do something in the software and the software asks you to confirm something. And so typically it says, are you sure you want to do this action? And the response typically you'll get, it's either one or two. One is going to be okay or confirm or cancel, right? So when I was having this conversation with the guy and, and, and I said, we need to make it better. He said, why? This is the standard. Everyone uses it. That's fine. That's normal. That people understand that. And I said, no, because we're all humans. And let me ask you a question. You're fairly technical. He said, yes. I'm like, okay. When you go to a coffee shop and you approach the barista and you say, I would like a tall coffee or a medium-sized coffee with uh, skim milk. The barista says, okay, coming right up. You turn around and you walk away. Suddenly, barista hollers at you and says, hey, are you sure you want skim milk? Now, is your answer is confirm or cancel or yes or no? And that's the difference. Do we want to talk to our users as another user or another human being, or do you want to talk to them as a machine, right? Um, and so I always try to uh, find kind of world type resemblance of similar situations and try to communicate it in such a way because then it becomes more simpler for the person who's not a designer or not technical to understand what exactly you're talking about. Uh, let's see, second one, it's... It sounds really frustrating when there is conflict because people want different things and they're on their end. How do you manage to stress? How do you manage the stress? And do you have any advice how to communicate with them? Um, first thing is don't take things personally ever, like literally. Unless somebody is purposely targeting you, that's a different conversation that you need to go to HR and address it in a different way. Uh, but if you get a feedback and somebody says, I don't like this or I don't like that, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's, it's their opinion. Uh, typically how I uh, combat such uh, behavior when people are uh, creating this kind of a conflict, I always say, if you want to convince me, convince me with the why. Don't tell me that you don't like it or there's a problem. Explain to me why there is a problem and why you don't like it. If you convince me with that, I will address it. We'll have a conversation about it. And one of the things that I practice uh, over the years, and don't get me wrong, my first probably five, six, seven years of my career, I was a hothead. I would have arguments. I would yell. I would, uh, you know, <laughs> shut doors. I will walk out of the meeting. I was... I wasn't an easy person to work with, uh, at least the first couple of years of my career. But you know, you learn in a hard way. Um, I've learned to be 
kind of a poker face, right? People arguing, they're, they're having their discussions and so forth. I'll just be sitting there and listening. Because the one thing you probably should do more is listen, more than talk. When you have four or five, six people in the meeting and they're constantly arguing with each other and they're kind of at each other's throat, just sit inside, just listen. Because in that kind of an argument, you might pick up on certain uh, really important things and, and then you can throw it back at them and, and say, we should be addressing it this way and this is why. Uh, and again, when you have a system in place that allows you to walk into a meeting with data backing your decisions and backing your design decisions, it's a lot easier and simpler to make uh, uh, to make your case. Because when you walk in with your designs and say, this is what I designed because I think it's great. Well, that's your opinion. You think it's great, I don't. But when you walk into a meeting and you say, this is what I designed and I just tested it with another 50 people and 45 of them enjoyed using it, that's a very different conversation right there. I hope I answered the question. Um, I'm going to address another part of the managing stress. Um, managing stress within the organization is, is very different. It depends on the organization. So it's something that you're probably going to learn within the company itself. Uh, you kind of sense, you know, stress levels of different people and what they respond to. So over time, you will learn how to do that personally. Um, managing stress is highly important because at some point you'll just, you'll just, you'll just kind of burn out. Um, as I mentioned, don't, don't take it personally. I typically don't, I try to kind of, okay, somebody said something to me, cool. Um, also as a creative, as a designer, as a UXer, you should be empathizing with other people. So understanding that somebody being angry right now with you might not necessarily be that they're angry with you. Maybe they just came into work angry that day and you were just there and you were the first one they met at the meeting and you said something that triggered them. So just take it lightly, you know, don't respond with the same anger. Uh, try to understand why or where the person is coming from. Uh, and outside of it, well, I'm a cyclist, so I bike. I'm also a photographer, so I use my camera to kind of distract myself. I have hobbies. And I think hobbies are extremely important outside of work to do something that is not work-related because otherwise you're just going to go crazy <laughs> after a while. Next question. Also, your PowerPoint looks awesome. Was it from a template or did you create from blank slides? Uh, blank slides and keynote. But it is a template because I created that template. And I am reusing that template in almost every presentation I've been doing in the last probably year and a half. But yes, I created uh, that one a year and a half ago. Uh, simple hair flow. Thank you. You're very, very, very welcome. Uh, do you have any pieces of advice that you wish someone had given you when you were a student starting out as a designer? Incredible question and short answer. Um, actually, I don't have a short answer. Give me a minute. Um, unfortunately, I would say that there was no one who could have given me an advice because when I was starting out, this industry was basically in its infancy. The only advice that I probably could have gotten from people was um, uh, don't rush and, and take your time and things. But at the same time, I was, I was one of the many, many starting out designers in the early 2000s when the internet was just kind of ramping back up from the major dot-com collapse. Uh, and so we were, we were all basically kind of poking around and hoping something will work uh, and learning as we go because schools did not offer anything like that. There are literally no schools that are teaching web design or UX or interaction or any of that sort. Everything was related either to human computer interaction and, the, and typically the degree was directly related to computers themselves and the hardware. Uh, or it was um, uh, interior design, graphic design, print, things like that, which I did. Uh, graduated from graphic design in 1998. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that there is an advice somebody could have given me, but I, I, I wish somebody would have given me an advice of just don't rush because I was rushing and um, essentially 
uh, putting my entire life on hold for probably seven to 10 years of trying to make it in this, in this career and being very hungry to succeed. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I typically tell people, just chill. Uh, don't forget about your friends and family. <laughs> uh, have a life. Uh, that's, that's important. Uh, let's see, next question. You're a very experienced designer. How different are beginner designers now than beginner designers then? How do you stay on top of design industry? That's an incredible question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, have, I have several answers to that. Uh, one, designers back in my day, we were very experimental. Like, holy crap. We were really experimental. We, we were trying things. We were failing all the time, learning new things. Um, and the sad part about it is that we were doing these learnings on the backs of our clients, <laughs> essentially uh, experimenting with their own projects and their own products. Um, the difference between then and now that I see, at least in, in, my, uh, in my opinion, is that there are too many uh, template-like and cookie-cutter type uh, approach to things, right? Now you have all these methodologies, and granted, I just gave a presentation on another system, um, <laughs> but it's not about designing. That's the thing. That's just the system that I created. Uh, it's not about designing something better. It's just about making better decisions for the company and the product uh, roadmap. It's not about how to design. It's not about how to research. It's not about what kind of... Uh, system to use in order to get better research results. I think uh, the major difference, yes, it's, it's the fact that we were a lot more experimental and weren't afraid to do something extremely radical. Like you would see, if I would put 1,000 websites of 1,000 companies in the exact same industry from 2002 or three, every single one of them will look different. Now, I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad, but it was unique, right? So when you land on the company's website, the next time you see this website at a corner of your eye, you know what the company is, right? You can quickly and easily recognize. Right now, a lot of the websites, a lot of the products are looking very, very similarly or at least utilize very similar, if not identical patterns of navigation, interaction, uh, um, uh, presentation, layout, and so forth. And there is a case for that, is to make everything very unified so people don't get confused wherever they go. But it also makes everything a little boring uh, when there's no uniqueness in it. Uh, it's the same way when people ask me, my mentees sometimes ask me, how do I, present myself to the employer. And I always say, be unique, be yourself. Don't, don't try to copy other people. Don't try to uh, have the same kind of style of a website or the same uh, resume. Because if I tomorrow as a hiring manager, which I am, will put in front of myself 10 resumes and each one of them is gonna have the same thing, how do I know who's the better one to pick? So just be yourself and, and be unique. Um, how do you stay on top of design industry? Learning. I know you guys graduating or probably will be graduating soon from school and you might think that um, that's it. It's not. I have news for you. It's a never, a learner, a never ending process. I have books on top books. I, I create a library of books on my website. Um, I listen to podcasts all the time. I go through courses all the time. Um, I talk to other designers, other design leaders. We constantly exchange ideas. We have different our own forums where we communicate with each other. Uh, I'm constantly trying to see, figure out, find, learn new trends, new things, what's going on there, what's going on there. And I also like to adapt a lot of the things from different industries, such as uh, um, uh, aircraft industry of engineering, uh, physical products, um, I don't know, interior design, uh, space design, uh, industrial design, and so forth. And yeah, I'm a big gadget guy and I buy things like 
$30 smartwatches, you know, uh, that actually not that bad. So this is how I typically stay on, on top of things is, is constantly learning, never stopping, literally. And I've been doing this for, as I said, almost 25 years. And uh, I try to accomplish at least one uh, course certificate every year, um, at least in the last five, six years. Uh, I try to learn at least one new thing every year. Uh, I try to commit myself to something very different outside of work uh, every year, just to keep learning. Uh, next one, I have to, oh, somebody said I have to step up. Okay. Uh, okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Jan, for the time you're provided to all of us. Absolutely, my pleasure. If there's any other questions, Feel free. Otherwise, you can book time with me outside of this. <laughs> yeah, um, just just to let you know, if there aren't any more questions, I pasted a link to um, Jan's links, and you can check that out in the chat box. And there's also a link to the Catalyst virtual swag bag, so you guys can also check out about um, Jan and his websites there as well. Um, and the recording of today's workshop will be posted on Forge's YouTube channel. Uh, and so if you want to check it out one more time and watch it after the workshop, you have that resource. And I um, wanted to say thank you so much, Jan, for leading um, today's workshop. I learned a lot about the data triangle system, and I bet I'm so sure that everyone in this meeting and who will be watching the YouTube channel will learn a lot from you as well. And thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting. It was, it was a blast. It was great talking to everyone. And uh, again, if everyone has any questions, I'm always available on social media, through my website, ADP list. They can always reach out and talk to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions people might have. Again, thank you for your time and thank you for tuning in. Have a great weekend and good luck with the uh, design -a -thon. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll stop screen recording.